He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, that whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's uh, pray together. Heavenly Father, may uh, I do some justice to the glory of Jesus through my words this morning. As we ponder the magnificence found in these verses, the fulfilment of your promises, won't you lift up our hearts in worship? Fill us with the hope and peace that is found in reconciliation. And draw us towards Jesus that we might continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope that is the gospel. Amen. So we're looking at this uh, final few verses of this little song here in Paul's letter to the Colossians. And this morning, uh, we are beginning to get properly uh, Christmassy together. Uh, because today's section there in verses uh, 19 and 20 in our little series actually take us to the heart of what Christmas is all about. Uh, They give us two themes of Christmas that any carol actually worth its socks uh, will point you to. Uh, Because these verses remind us firstly that uh, the Jesus of the Christmas manger is uh, God with us. And then secondly that the Jesus of the Christmas manger is God for us as he comes to bring reconciliation and peace. God with us and God for us. Two themes at the heart of Christmas that ought to to leave us singing together, actually. Oh, come, let us adore him. So uh, let's unpack them. And we'll start there in verse 19. As Paul tells us that Jesus is the Emmanuel, that is, Jesus is God with us. Because look at verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And the word in the uh, original language there for fullness is the same word that would have uh, been used to describe completeness. That's like when you have 11 players on a a football team, you have a complete team. Well, in uh, the same way as one guy I read on this passage puts it, there was nothing whatsoever of the Godhead that was not in Christ. The the full complement of divine attributes is to be found in him. Which means that first Christmas, as Mary held Jesus in her arms, she cradled God himself. As the disciples walked and ate with Jesus, they walked and ate with God himself. Mind-bending, right? God who, verse 16, made all things now enters his creation. Fully God, in verse 22, a body of flesh. As we look at Jesus, we see God. But please, just just in case uh, you're uh, switching off right now, thinking that this is just going to be a a repeat of the sermon from a couple of weeks ago when Paul told us in verse 15 that Jesus was the image of the invisible God. Well, Well, don't. Because whilst that is a ridiculous thing to get our minds around, whilst it does bear repeating often, that's not actually Paul's main point in verse 19 at all. Because actually what Paul wants us to get our heads around here is that word dwell. You see, one of the Bible's overarching themes all the way through the Bible could be uh, described as the story of God dwelling in the midst of his people. 
Uh, so think back to the blessing and peace of the Garden of Eden before uh, Adam and Eve rejected God's rule and were kicked out of God's presence and glory into the brokenness of, of life outside the garden. Do you, do you remember? We're told in Genesis there that God himself walked in the garden where everything was what? Very good. Or, or think how God's people back in the book of Exodus following their rescue by God from slavery in Egypt were instructed in Exodus 25 by God to build and furnish God a tabernacle, a massive tent, in order that he might come and dwell among them. And the book of Exodus actually ends on this massive high of God's glory, filling the tabernacle as God comes to lead and bless his people. Or think of Solomon, who built a, God a permanent temple in two chronicles in order that the people might experience the, the blessing of having a God's permanent dwelling in their midst. And the picture of life with God in the Bible, when God dwells in the midst of the people, it means it's a picture that is always a good picture. Always blessed, always prosperous, always joyful as the people of God walked with God, listening to him, putting him in his rightful place as God. Well, then God would protect them and lead them and care for them and provide for them. God was their God and they were God's people. But there's this continual cycle in the Bible, a, a continual problem that just like with Adam and Eve, despite the people having God in their midst, despite God being faithful towards them, well, over time they became hard hearted and rebellious and sinful. They would take God for granted. They would fail to listen to him. They would reject him and they lost sight of his glory. Until in this really sad moment, God says, well, enough is enough. Because of your sin, because of your rejection of me, I will give you what you want, a life without me. And Ezekiel chapter 10 gives us this horrific picture of God walking out of the relationship with his people. The, the removal men, the metaphorical removal men move in and they, they, they move God out and God leaves. And as does his blessing, the blessing of knowing God, it quickly actually turns into curse as the temple is destroyed and God's people are carried into exile. God no longer dwells with his people and his people are left a shadow of their former self, hopelessly weeping by the rivers of Babylon. Captives in a foreign land. And the point was this. In the Old Testament, life where God dwells in your midst, life with God as your God is a life full of blessing and of joy and of protection and of hope and of prosperity. God being with you meant God being for you. But life without God dwelling with you is a life of sorrow and fear and captivity. And as God left the building, people wept. Where will we find hope now? Where they looked for light all around, all they found was crushing darkness. The joy and blessing and wholeness of a life with God was no more. God's glory had gone from their midst. Except that from, from stage left, the prophets of old pop up. As God spoke to people and they keep making these amazing promises. They, they start proclaiming hope that one day into the future there would be a new time of blessing when God would once more return and dwell among his people. Where, where joy would abound again, where he would lead them once more as their good shepherd and their king, where he would care for them and protect them and bind them up and lead them to victories over their enemies. And on that day there would be blessing and joy and peace. The Hebrew word for it actually was shalom. Everything being and working as it should work. Because once again, God dwelt among his people. God was their God and they were his people. The, the Bible speaks of a day of reconciliation. Isaiah puts it like this. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You, that's God, have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. 
for the yoke of his, that's their oppressive ruler, the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor, you have broken us on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. That's Isaiah 9 and elsewhere in Isaiah 52 he tells us how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice, together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. That's the return of God to his people. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. A day of rescue, a day of hope, a day of peace, a day of joy. And so now with all that in mind, just look at verse 19 of Colossians again. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Do you see what Paul's saying here? Jesus is God returning to his people. As God dwells in Jesus and Jesus dwells among us 2,000 years ago physically, today by his Holy Spirit and into the future as Revelation 21 puts it in glory... Well, then Jesus is God's means of blessing the whole world. Jesus is God's means of peace. Jesus is our hope in the face of our enemies, not least sin and death. Jesus is our joy. Jesus is our Emmanuel. Jesus is God with us. And look what that means for us. Because Jesus is not only God with us. No, as I've already said, he's, he's also God for us. Look at verse 20. I'll start with 19 again. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, as as we've heard, there is broken relationship between God and humanity, right? Enmity. Time after time in the Old Testament, we see that because of our sin, God removes his presence from his people. Whether it's his glory leaving the temple or Adam and Eve being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, human sin, our rebellion, our refusal to live with God as God continually rears its head and breaks friendship with God. Look at verse 21, Paul sums it up there. It leaves us alienated and hostile in mind towards God. And more than that, actually, it's not just about us. It leaves the entire creation messed up and broken. And the Bible continually tells us that that shalom we talked about, perfect peace, where all created things work as they should work, is broken and decaying because of our sinfulness. And because of that, the world, the entire creation, that all things of verse 16 are under curse because of our sin. So sickness and poverty and injustice and famine and global warming and abuse and even natural disasters are all consequences of humanity essentially sticking two fingers up at God and telling him to bog off. But what is utterly amazing about Christmas, what is utterly amazing about Jesus is that despite our arrogance and our ungratefulness and our treachery and our rebellion, despite our utter contempt for God, despite our adulterous hearts that chase after and worship all sorts of false idols as if they were the last of the sausage balls at a Christmas dinner, well, God, rather than kicking us to the curb, rather than letting us wallow in our sin, rather than simply clicking his fingers and sending us to oblivion, takes the initiative and says, hey, do you want to be friends again? Should we start over? 
I can be your God and you can be my people. And this time it won't break because of your sinfulness. This time I won't leave because, well, I have a plan. It's always been the plan, actually. It's no different. My prophets will tell you that. But my plan is there in verse 20. As God himself comes to reconcile all things to himself by making peace with himself through the death of himself, in verse 22, the flesh. As God himself comes to reconcile all things to himself by making peace with himself through the death of himself in the flesh. God, a God of justice, says it is possible for reconciliation. For enemies to become friends once more. So I'll tell you what, rather than you bearing the responsibility for your rebellion, rather than you being wiped out in death, uh, rather than you facing my wrath and my anger for sin, rather than you living under the curse of sin and death that is impacting the whole of my creation, I'll take it as I come into the world as flesh in order to be your substitute. I'll die your death. I'll break your curse. I'll shed sacrificial blood on your behalf in order that, verse 22, you can be dressed appropriately for eternity. So that rather than being alienated and hostile in mind toward me, you can now instead approach me in peace as I present you holy and blameless and above reproach. If indeed, verse 23, because there is a caveat, if indeed you continue in the faith stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. You see, this salvation, this rescue, this reconciliation, enemies becoming friends, this peace is for those who say, yes, I want this reconciliation. I want what God is offering. I want to live with God as my God and me as one of his people. I trust God's means of rescue. I trust his means of reconciliation. I recognize that I've been hostile to him and I want to return and bow the knee to King Jesus where I trust he will lead me into a joy, a life of joy and peace and blessing. See, this is the hope and joy of Christmas. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. And look at the tense, verse 22. When is this reconciliation to take place? Do you see? He has now reconciled. This, this reconciliation is possible now. You can bask in relationship with God now. You can relate to God now. Through God's spirit, you can enter the throne room of heaven in prayer. Now you can enjoy all the blessings and securities of being in friendship with God now. What was it we said? What was it the prophets foresaw? Life where God dwells in our midst, a life full of blessing and joy and protection of hope. As God leads us and cares for us and keeps us. As he goes to battle for us against our enemies of sin and death. God being with you means God being for you. But then listen to this because it, because it gets better. You see, as Jesus came once, so the Bible story of God dwelling with his people continues. And it tells us that one day into the future, he's going to come again. And when then that happens, well then, my friends, we'll see God face to face. We'll bask in God's presence Physically. You see, we know right, don't we, in, in these COVID times, in this COVID world that we're living in just now, how important face-to-face -face meetings are for relationship. If this year has taught us anything, even the most introverted of us, it is wonderful to be able to hang out with people, right? What a joy we will have as we rest in one another's presence. More than just a Zoom call. Well, the Bible says as we follow this theme of dwelling through, that one day that's going to happen with us and God. No longer will our relationship with God feel like a Zoom call where we're left craving for more. No longer will the reconciliation of all things feel jarring with the brokenness of this world. No, because Revelation, the book of the Bible that is most concerned with all that is the Christian's future, tells us that one day this broken, cursed world is going to be made new. A day when there will be 
a new heaven and a new earth. Where the dwelling place of God will be with man, he will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Where he will wipe every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more and neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. A day is coming when we will meet God face to face where once and for all we will find perfect shalom. Where there will be no more sickness, sin or death, no more broken relationships, no more lockdowns and tear systems, no more stress at work, no more uh, loneliness, no more anxiety at life, no more hurt, shame, guilt or pain, where creation will work as it was meant to work, where our king will lead with justice and righteousness, where darkness will not reign, where, where God dwells and we are his people and he is our God forever. But until then, friends, keep going. Keep going. Re- rejoice that God, despite being the innocent party, reached out the hand of reconciliation to you and offered you his undeserved favour. I don't know about you, but when Lil and I fall out, I know it's hard to believe that we would ever fall out. Then what happens is that we, we wait for the person who was in the wrong, more often than not me, to come and apologise, to make the first move of reconciliation, but not God. No, the one who has been sinned against by you and me in Jesus takes the initiative to restore relationship. He comes and offers peace. If you haven't taken that peace yet, can I suggest you do? Because it is good to be reconciled to God. It is Blessing and joy and hope and peace. And also rejoice, Christian, rejoice that reconciliation need not rely on your abilities or strength or good works, but instead on the cross of Jesus. You see, God is the only stakeholder in getting you to that eternity. As he appeases himself over your sin. Listen, here's the thing. If this is you, just please hear this. You don't want to be responsible for your own standing with God. You don't want to be responsible for getting yourself into his eternity because where's the assurance in that? If salvation and reconciliation is dependent on me, then where is the assurance in that? I'm useless. At most things. But how wonderful God himself came in the flesh to reconcile us to himself. I hope is in him and not us. And that is, friends, that is good news. Uh, and so rejoice. Rejoice that right now if you're a Christian, you are in the very real presence of God himself, presented holy and blameless and above reproach. That's your, that's your status before God. Bask in his rest this Christmas in the fact that there is light in the darkness, that there is relief in the joy, that your maker is your redeemer and your very present help in time of need. You are reconciled to God. He is your God. You are his people. He is and he will be victorious even over your greatest of enemies, sin and death. So rejoice. Rejoice, even in the darkness that is this Christmas. Rejoice because there is light and there is hope. And then finally this Christmas, please proclaim him. Proclaim him from the rooftops. Because here's the thing, if if shalom, if peace is to be found in this world, this little passage tells us it is only to be found in and through the reconciling of all things to Jesus. This is the light in the darkness that the world needs right now. And it is a far better light, a far better joy than all the Christmas lights we see when we're out and about that make us smile. It is true light in deep darkness. 
And so it's only as more of us, more of our world meet Jesus and come under his good rule and his leadership, as more of this world are reconciled to him, that relationships will be restored and abuse will be ended and falsehood will be removed and creation will be liberated and poverty will be finished and sickness will be treated and death will be defeated and the curse will finally be reversed because it is in him and through him and to him that all things are reconciled. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. By the blood of his cross. Christians ought to be people who are very much involved in making the world better for people. We ought to be involved in social action programs, environmental causes, in charities and in good works. But only as we find our hope for the fixing of all that is broken in the reconciling work of Jesus. On their own, the... United Nations and the WHO and the NHS and charities and street WhatsApp groups can only plaster over the cracks. Only Jesus brings hope of reconciliation and renewal. So get involved in all that stuff, but with with a Jesus heart, with deep prayer, with a proclamation of the Christ, we must proclaim him, telling people of the reconciliation that is possible through the Jesus of the manger. Friends, I don't know how you're feeling this Christmas time. There's lots going on in the world, isn't there? Lots that make us feel miserable and dark, hopeless perhaps. But the fullness of God dwells in Jesus and he dwells amongst his people. He is God with us and he is God for us. Let's pray.